it is pretty hard work to crawl into the lion's mouth and turn around and crawl out again without exciting the suspicion of the lion. A quote from Captain George S. Anthony. didn't give it any like seafaring swagger <laughs> probably for the best you know? <laughs> I didn't throw any yars and- if you throw a yar in there that kind of that sets the wrong expectation for the listeners it's, it's so funny because it's just like he's a guy from massachusetts <laughs> like, right that's all yeah. he is <laughs> he's not he's not a pirate <laughs> this man shucks clams or shucks oysters and i don't know that's this is before celtics or like mass holes existed so it's true i mean i'm sure they weren't the most friendly people in the world because they're all just like hardened seafaring men. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> at the same time, it's probably a fun crowd if you get them out at the bars. That's what I've experienced every time I go to the East Coast. Like the stereotype is, oh, they're all so mean. But honestly, my fiance and I went to a bar. I think I told the story yeah, they, already. Yeah, they bought you clam yeah. chowder. <laughs> Instead of like buying like a round of beers, they said, oh, you're from out of town. Ah, get us some chowder. Get us some chowder. <laughs> it's like, this is a happiest place on earth this is hilarious uh that is so funny hello everybody speaking of chowder hello everybody welcome to the gems of history i'm gonna do that every week just just (laughs) pick one thing that we've said the preamble speaking of chowder (laughs) speaking of chowder welcome to the gems of history podcast everybody sure i'm your host jacob shop and with me as always evan roosh hey oh back again how we doing friday recording we got the drinks friday recordings are always something special they are i feel like we say that every time we record on a friday because we never do anymore i remember well i mean yeah when we started this back when we were 24 yeah we like friday recordings meant like vodka red bulls and yeah we now, were taking like three shots before we even press right. play and now like jacob brought over a beer and it's a 9.5 percent and we just like looked at it like holy cow i, do, I, I can only have like one of these like how whew, i'm gonna be in bed by nine <laughs> but it tastes like fruit juice it's yeah. so good <laughs> it's so good uh, but anyways how are you today Ev? doing great you know I want to talk about the weather, just like every single time you ask me this question, but I'm not going to, even though there was a tornado watch. But you got the house to yourself tonight? No, no lady? No fiance during the recording. So, just it's two guys having free reign at the house? Two guys sitting in a basement, <laughs> five, five feet, feet apart, because they're not gay. Where are we? <laughs> that, would, that would also <laughs> right be Right after you get engaged. <laughs> yeah, that would also be another shocker. Let's but. start start it, then the... Whenever we get a, a subreddit f- for ourselves, everyone's going to be like, did you hear an episode 110 when Jacob said, or are we? Or are we? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Start the lore now. <laughs> right, yeah. And then on the audio medium that we have, like people are going to say, rumors are that he winked. <laughs> <laughs> like Evan winked back and blew a kiss. Like, he hell? didn't have his fingers crossed behind his back. Right. He didn't say no homo at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyways, we got a lot to get through today, actually. This has turned... it. It's funny. Because I texted you like, oh, we'll just do one of these two topics. Should be a nice, easy week. And then I couldn't find any real cohesive articles on the topic. And I was like, oh, well, this book popped up when I Google searched it. So I might as well read this. And I read the entire thing. So now we have a 10-page outline. of a From a 300-page book. So you wrote... 400. <laughs> Four. so, yeah, All right. So it's a... Uh, uh, trying to condense 400 pages into yeah. 10 pages. But so. props to you. You grinded that entire thing in one night. It helped. Whereas I have to admit, I use the internet. <laughs> it helped that the book was actually good, though, because there's times when I, I'll buy books for research for the show and it'll be like me reading 10 pages and then falling asleep because <laughs> it's, it's just straight facts. This one, it was way different. Or We're, it's the mind-bending numbness of something like the Denver airport or Project Paperclip or yeah. what was the one where the guy was visited and had a threesome with aliens? That guy wrote a book that you read? Oh, that was The Men in Black. The Men in Black yeah. So That's right, yeah. <laughs> but that book was fun, too, because it was so preposterous. <laughs> oh, can you imagine if that was a comic? It should have been a comic book, but... It, yes, Absolutely. <laughs> But today we're talking about the Catulpa Prison Rescue, which I had literally never heard of before right. I started researching this week. And I don't even remember. I think I found it either because I wanted to do an Australian topic 
and I was looking into like the what happened on this day in history things, and I oh, think yeah. it, it either popped up in one of those research endeavors. But yeah, I found it, and I was like, this sounds fun. And we haven't done a a, a heist type rescue right. episode in a long time, so. And I loved watching Prison Break growing up, so it's kind of the perfect thing. Yeah, so uh, I read a book called The Catalpa Rescue by a man named Peter Fitzsimmons. And it's a very, it's a very fun book. It's one of the most fun historical nonfiction, nonfiction books I think I've read so far for the show. But he writes it like he's the overseeing eye of the narrator, but he also writes mm. it like he's trying to pitch it as a story for like a TV show. Right. And then he threw in some loose stand up comedy with what's the deal <laughs> with all the potatoes going out? Uh, yeah, but. I would recommend reading it if you're interested in this topic. There is so many details that I had to leave out of this story that are pretty interesting in their own rights. So we're we're going to do a lot of generalizations and uh, condensing of the topic this week. There's a lot of whaling information in there that I never talk about in this. So I, I do want to talk about the whaling, like the history the of whaling. Industry. Yeah, because yeah. it is fascinating. It really is, especially like the Japanese whaling. Yeah. Like that was just a huge boom to their economy. Yeah, but these guys literally outfitted ships with like a giant like stove so they could burn away all the, the whale fats and stuff like that. And then they had mm-hmm. like a giant area where they just cut the whale apart. So it's just like this giant slaughterhouse on top of a ship that's floating in the middle of the water. <laughs> Ew. It's fascinating. <laughs> but yeah, it's disgusting. <laughs> I'll talk a, a little bit about later, but okay. We got a big big topic. Should we get right into it? You know what? Let's whale on in. I was going to say dive on in. I was going to as well, but, you know, whales. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Let's breach the surface like a whale on in. <laughs> <laughs> let's throw some whale noises in there. This is another thing before we get started. I went into this thinking this was an Australian story. No, this is an Irish story. Oh, yeah. <laughs> very much an Irish it's a story. very much an Irish Just story. Just comes to Australia. Yeah. <laughs> so that's another funny thing about that. Okay, and one final, final thing before we get started. We are, this week is technically supposed to be the week that we are going to do our listener topic for our Patreon, but a combination of us being bad at planning and also the fact that the f- first of the year is the next episode, it's c- pretty much like so close that we just said we'll, right. do, we'll do an episode this week and then we'll do the listener one next week. But yeah, the, for those of you wondering, we will be doing the Patreon episode next week. Don't worry, we didn't forget. So... Yes, you'll get what you want. So yeah. log on, log on. How old am I? <laughs> sign up. <laughs> yes, sign up. You, dial in. <laughs> you use your dial up internet to get on our Patreon if you want to be part of the next one. Right, right. But go on the Patreon, cast your vote, suggest a topic, and we would love to do one for you. And even though it might make me sad again, <laughs> like Unit 731, which, by the way, was a great episode. To uh, talk about and research, you know, it's very important. The next one's but very, it made me sad. The next one's very much more lighthearted than that one. So, uh, but you history. Find it's finally going to be the history of moose. <laughs> <laughs> You're not far off. So, <laughs> so we'll we'll do that next week. But uh, yeah, that before we get into it, we just wanted to mention that. Basically, since the 12th century, Ireland was under the thumb of the British Empire. Because in 1171, the troops of King Henry II of England came into Ireland and invaded, and for the next 600 years, there were skirmishes on and off between the two entities, and as Peter Fitzsimmons calls them in the book, he calls them risings, when the Irish kind of stand up and say, hey, we want to be independent again. Yeah, he calls them risings. Which uh, the Irish very, like, once we get through the entire story here and... Of course, there's the IRA, like there's tons of backstory of the Irish and the British throughout history. When Queen Elizabeth recently died, all of like Irish Twitter, which apparently exists, was just celebrating. Oh, like yeah. there were Irish people like dancing in front of uh, Buckingham Palace, yeah. like they, the pubs. Like I saw videos of, you would have thought that they just like won World War II. So like, there's a lot of yeah. context of why the Irish freaking hate the British, and we're about to dive into that. Well, I mean, they didn't get to be a republic until like the mid 1900s. So yeah, until there, the, there's until not, the car bombs. Yeah, yeah, there's not much time in there between when they got independence and when she she was alive before when they, they got, got independence. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So things really started to come to a head around the 17th and 18th centuries in Ireland between them and the British. And after a treaty was agreed to between the Irish and the British in 1691, things kind of seemed like they were going from a boil to a simmer. It was settling down a little bit. So the Irish said they would lay down their arms in return for freedom and the, the ability to practice their own Catholic faith because the British are trying to push Protestantism on them. So the, Cath- the Catholics are all like, well, we have a very dominant faith system in our country and we want to keep that. But in only a few years, the parliament introduced what were known as penal laws, which were directly aimed at the Catholics and limited their freedoms not only religiously, but in everyday life. Basically saying you can't hold office, you can't do certain things on certain days. Right. The British Parliament said, yes, we will give you the freedoms to practice your own religion, which, by the way, is the same religion, mind you. You know, they're still the same main guy. Yeah. But they had their fingers crossed behind their backs. And so like, we'll give was, you, well, what, what, what can one do? We'll give you two years. <laughs> yeah, we'll give you two years of religious freedom to, you no, know, again, worship the same guy. Come on. We gave you two years. Isn't that enough? Right. What's yeah. two years between friends? <laughs> What's two years? Yeah. <laughs> Old chum, some yeah. would say. So this led to 1798, when the Irish decided that they had had enough and united against the British with pikes in hand. They were led by a a man named Wolf Tone, which is an awesome name for a leader of a rebellion. And the rebellion lasted from May until October of 1798, with the rebels holding their own surprisingly well against the well-trained and well-armed British forces for being basically peasants with pikes. But alas, the uprising was strangled out of existence, and Wolf Tone was captured and died before he was even able to serve his death sentence. Right, like, let's remember, they, like, for the way that you mentioned, like, pikes in hand, guns were very much invented by yep. this point. Oh, yeah. And the British had just about all of them, and a huge supply of gunpowder, and, you know, cannons. Like, you They're the richest much. empire in the world. <laughs> right, I mean, literally, like... So for these guys to go up against them with just pointy sticks, yeah. <laughs> that's impressive resolve. To go that out is there that Irish that. resolve, for yeah. sure. After this happened, the British gripped even harder on Ireland, and they got rid of their par- the Irish Parliament and made them accountable to the main British Parliament. Laws were quickly passed to demand more exports from Ireland, pretty much making the country poorer and taking the land from the Irish farmers who had worked it for generations while also making the British Empire richer. Yeah, the British hated the Irish. And like we'll see with the potato famine when we talk about it, like there is, and we even saw it in uh, America quite a bit with uh, the OG British settlers, if you will, like with Irish immigrants, like Irish immigrants in America were treated very much like trash along with like all immigrants. But the British in particular hate yeah. the Irish. If you want to learn more about that, you can go back and listen to our American Mafia series that we did. We kind yes. of talk about that a little bit, how the Irish were pretty much the scapegoat for a lot of things at the beginning. So, Oh, a lot of it was just blame the Irish. Yeah. So with all of this negotiation going on with new laws taking their land, it didn't take long before the Irish were starving, but it wasn't for lack of food. The land was producing a good crop yield, but England was taking what they wanted and then weren't giving any of the profits to Ireland. Irish writer Jonathan Jonathan Swift made the situation clear when he said that the English would sooner support the Irish eating their own babies rather than share any of the money that they made through Irish labor. Right, especially like this is during England's colonial days, right? Like they are fighting just about all over the world. And Irish is, or Ireland is known for growing potatoes. Potatoes last a very long time. So when you're trying to feed an army that's in India and you need to ship food to them, potatoes are a great option. Yeah. So and, and it's not just like they're taking their grain, they're taking their wheat, oh, they're taking everything. literally everything that they're growing. They're taking like 90% of it. Mm-hmm. And that's why the Irish subsisted on potatoes so much. It's just because that's mostly what they had on hand to eat. Right. But it's funny because the Irish were the tallest people in this area of the world for a long time because potatoes are nutritious. Dang, like if, they only get- the league, if only the NBA was around. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> Since the 1500s, Ireland had failed no fewer than 15 times to thri- try and throw off the hand of the British that didn't feed them, but all they had to show for it was even more British intervention and less food. 
So by the mid-1840s, things went from bad to even worse, because a blight hit the potato crop in Ireland, which was, as I just mentioned, their main source of food in the country, and the peasants were just hit really hard. Two years of consistent heavy rains and constant exports of other grains left the common laborers with pretty much no answer to their hunger. So by the end of the decade, estimates put the number of deaths from the Irish potato famine or the Great Irish Famine at nearly one million people. Right. And also the British, fun fact, were kind of, they didn't like label it as a blockade, but they were essentially blockading Irish yeah. ports. They, so they controlled the ports. So you they weren't sending actual food food in there, or all food had to go through Britain and then to Ireland. To Ireland. And it took, it took the Great Irish Famine for the British to repeal what was known as the Corn Laws, which yeah. basically in, artificially inflated the price of, of corn and uh, other grains and stuff in Ireland, because they said you can only buy from other people if it is a, if the corn or the grain is a certain price point. Mm -hmm. So they just kept inflating it artificially so that they would have to buy it from Britain. And they this is what took to this is what it took to finally repeal that law. <laughs> it is interesting that economic practices or like economic warfare, if you will, like it happened since the beginning of time. It's yeah. not a new concept. Not at all. Much to the dismay of the deceased Jonathan Swift that I mentioned earlier, reports of cannibalism did begin to surface as family resorted to eating their own dead family members in addition to killing and eating the dogs who were surviving off of the dead humans in the, in the towns and the little settlements. That is, now that makes me want to cry as a, as a proud dog dad of two beautiful black labs. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not a good scenario. No. According to the founding director of Ireland's Great Hunger Institute, whose name is Christine Keneally, the reason Ireland was hit so seriously by this famine wasn't because they were the only ones hit by this blight, but mostly because they were so much more reliant on the potato crops than the other parts of the UK and the other parts of Europe that were around that area. It's pretty much just because that's all they had to subsist on. While the Irish were dying, the English didn't really do a whole lot to help. And once again, according to Christine Keneally, there was a short summertime soup kitchen that the English, the British did set up in Ireland in 1847 that served nearly 3 million people during its operations every day at the height of it. But that was only one time that it would appear and it was just that one summertime. That's nuts. Like a, a summertime kitchen yeah. in a country that has probably seven months eight months of non-summer. Yeah. Like that is so and that's 3 million people a day. That's 40% of Ireland's population yeah. at the time. Yeah. Just relying on this kitchen. Yeah. Like, that's insane. So it shows that they had logistical means to support the British or to support the Irish during this time. They just chose not to. Oh yeah. They app, like we mentioned before, richest empire probably in world history. <laughs> yeah. Like one of, them you had the a power Persians. rank them. Yeah. If you had a power rank them, they're up there. So it's not, it, they definitely have the capability to. Yeah. Mostly in the it, the reason they don't logistically support it is because in that same year that the soup kitchen was opened, a new prime minister was elected in England, and he was not from one of the major political parties. So he decided that he needed to get really careful about how he did policy in certain areas, just so that he would keep that approval that he had. And to do this, he decided that he had to keep spending low, and of course, that meant no funding to the Irish. At the same time, he did try and implement what he called work programs that he set up in Ireland, but these public works meant basically that the Irish had to go out in the, one of the harshest winters on record, like recent record, with no shoes, barely any suitable clothing for minimum wage to try and support their families and try and feed themselves. And also stay alive, again, during the winter with no shoes. Yeah, the one of the... They said it was one of the worst winters on yeah. record, so yeah, it's, it's not good. The minimal food, terrible weather, and the lack of logistical support from the British led to, as I mentioned, possibly a million deaths, but also nearly two million emigrations from Ireland to places like the U.S. and Canada. And it's important that those people left because Ireland still has never fully recovered from the population drop because over eight million people lived in Ireland at the time of the famine. And the population of Ireland is currently sitting at like somewhere between five to six million. 
Wow. So it has, it's not even really that close to recovering. And that's just the Republic of Ireland. There are certain parts of Ireland that aren't technically Republic. So it's probably somewhere closer to six to seven million. But even so, it still hasn't recovered that eight million. Right. That is such a long, that's such a long time to like not repopulate. Oh, that's 170 like, that's 170 years. years yeah. yeah. And to add insult to injury, the head of the UK Treasury at the time said it was Ireland's fault that it was all happening, saying, quote, The judgment of God sent the calamity to teach the Irish a lesson, and that calamity must not be too much mitigated. The real evil we have to contend is not the physical evil of the famine, but the moral evil of the selfish, perverse, and turbulent character of the people, end quote. I mean, that's the head of the treasure. Like, that's a state official being like, well, you know what? God did it. Yeah. Like, I don't think <laughs> God was... They, they made God do this. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> the, God, meaning the British government, yeah. decided to starve out. No, we could... That soup kitchen thing didn't happen. Didn't happen. Mm-mm. <laughs> Once again, what's two years between friends? <laughs> <laughs> what's, a fun, what's a fun little summer of soup <laughs> between friends? No soup for you. Oh, my God. <laughs> they were the original soup Nazis. Yeah. yeah. But the Irish, once again, did not take this lying down. This, was, this major indifference and victim blame from in- the English led some of the youth of Ireland to realize that it was going to be them who would need to take up the fight for Irish freedom. And a group known as the Young Ireland Movement began to make fiery statements of revolution and disregard for government whose laws had starved their people. Their leader was captured and jailed pretty quickly, but that was just the beginning, because another would rise from the ashes and light a new spark under this group. His name was James Stevens, and he was a 23-year-old spitfire from the Young Ireland Movement. His speeches were so inspired that four days after his first, a group took up arms and attempted to fight the British. Four days four days after hearing a 23-year-old. That's, like, that's impactful. Talk about Young Ireland. This guy is... The embodiment of Young Ireland. Imagine a college kid that just graduated and they just got on a podium, maybe at the local local pub, again, like with Irish, and just started spitting mad, mad shit at the British. Yeah. And I mean, these are all the kids, pretty much, of the people that have died during the famine. Their parents are probably gone. They're probably orphaned. They've There's probably so been, many orphans. Yeah. So these kids are all just looking for somewhere to expel all this anger that they have for the right. people that put them in this scenario. So it makes sense that one guy comes up and gives a, a rousing speech, and there you go. It had to be a great speech. <laughs> it must have been. When this uprising took place, the people that were taking part of it, it, it they expected the peasantry to follow them into battle. But the conflict was pretty one-sided, and the Irish were, once again, put down pretty easily. So James Stevens himself didn't get captured during the battle and decided he needed to flee. So he did so in quite an unorthodox fashion. And this is is one of, like... One could say, yeah. (laughs) This is one of, like, the funny parts of this. There's multiple stories in this that are like, what? Yeah. (laughs) So he used his youthful looks and dressed as a maid and fled first to London and then to Paris. It's a long time to be wearing, I'm assuming, some sort of wig. I don't know if he did it the whole time or if it was just to get out of Ireland, but I, I'm imagining him wearing a maid <laughs> outfit for like three months right, as like he travels crossing, to France. <laughs> yeah, crossing the sea, like crossing <laughs> the strait from Ireland to, and of course, to France. Since I watch anime, I'm imagining him in like the cat oh, yeah. ears with like the, the bloody maid Saying outfit. Saying like senpai <laughs> and like some shit. <laughs> How can I serve you, master? Oh, God. <laughs> Too far in. Too, I know we've both been watching Demon Slayer. But. <laughs> so while in Paris, Stephen learned a thing or two about how to organize a revolution since the French are like the masters of revolutions. Honestly, one of the top revolutionary, if we, again, had to throw like a top five out there. They're at the, they have they, to be at the top. <laughs> they're still they doing it. They have to be. I they're mean, doing it today. <laughs> well, oh my God. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> always doing it. <laughs> they're always doing it. Probably them one, maybe United States two. I mean, we've only had to do it like once, though. That's the thing. But there was that second time that the South tried. They just say so, they tried. <laughs> but they weren't successful, so never mind. We're so out the, the North gets We're out of the top the five. North gets the North gets the number two spot. 
<laughs> so he spent time in in France with other Irish patriot escapees, and he realized that the way the Americans had shirked off the British was by organizing an army of their own. And this was the beginning of the process of raising a true rebellion in Ireland underneath pretty much just his control. Yeah, this whole time, uh, just like doing the research like for this, when you think, it just got me thinking about like alternate historical timelines, right? Like if the U.S. would have lost the Revolutionary War, do you think that we're looking at the same type of persecution, if you will, from the British government? This is the thing is because Ireland is so close and oh, it's yeah. so much smaller than the U.S. I just feel like there wouldn't have been that much of a time period that they could have controlled it in mm-hmm. the same way that they did. Plus, there's like Spanish and French still fighting for America at the same time. Where right. Ireland's pretty much just Britain. <laughs> so, That's, that is kind of one of those things like we've talked about, I believe, during our coverage, like the 18, the War of 1812 and multiple stories about the Revolutionary War. Like America got pretty lucky. Like, yeah. Again, they were going up against the biggest colon or the biggest empire of probably since the 1800s, 1700s and forward. And we kind of got lucky. Oh, well, 100%. Yeah. We, and during the War of 1812, that's when Napoleon was trying to shoot a shot. So we yeah. definitely got lucky there, too. Yes, we did. So James Stevens officially returns to Ireland in 1856, and he begins to dress in disguises, like sometimes he dresses as a beggar, sometimes he dresses as a priest, and pretty much goes door to door and establishment to establishment, and begins to whisper his ideas of revolution into the ears of whoever would listen to him. And slowly but surely, people began to follow him. And as his first speech went, he is very charismatic. He's got very heavy Irish nationalist sentiment around him, and they proved to be useful tools to help him recruit people. And soon enough, James Stevens was declaring himself the provisional dictator of the Irish Republican Brotherhood, the new underground movement that he had just founded. The IRB. Yeah. IRB, yes. Yeah. And calling himself the dictator, it really proves like Ooh. how much stock he puts in the fact that like people need to listen to what I have to say, because I have a plan for how this is going to work. And if you don't listen, that plan is very easily going to fall apart. This man was also the master of disguise. Yes. Like, <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> like, if you want to think about that movie for a second, it was literally him. Yeah, he's dressing as a maid to get out of Ireland. Then yeah. he's dressing as a priest and a beggar. Later in the story, he dresses as a homeless person and yep. uses crutches. Like, it, He's got all sorts of disguises. But I mean, you have to think that's crucial for any sort of like guerrilla tactics or any rebellion. You can't be dressed up as, you know, you're classic revolutionary if you will you have right. to look like they're innocent and he knows right away that he has to keep everything that he tells these people very close to the chest yeah. and that's why he like says i'm the one that's in charge you mm-hmm. have to listen because if information starts leaking that's when problems are going to start mm-hmm. so once he finds the irb new recruits that are sworn in have to swear an oath and this Oath is to, quote, make Ireland an independent democratic republic. And those recruits who swear this oath were immediately given a task. You got to go recruit more people. We need numbers. And basically, this formed the structure of the IRB. At the head of the group was Stevens, of course, and below him were the A's, or the centers. And the center's job was to recruit nine B's, or captains. Those captains would each recruit nine C's, or sergeants, and those sergeants would recruit nine D's, or privates, which is funny. Nine privates, yeah. Nine D's, and <laughs> <it's> privates. <laughs> <laughs> Immature. But also, I mean, this is, when you lay it out like that, like, that's just the basis of every pyramid scheme it, yeah, I've this, ever it's heard. It's a pyramid like, scheme for revolution. <laughs> That's that's, the, that's, I mean, that's the title of the yeah, episode, that's right? Like, that's gotta be. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good plan. I mean, you yeah. just rec- you say, hey, recruit nine people. That's all you got to do. And then everyone else right. under them that recruits, hey, you just got to recruit nine people. And then there's four layers of people, like, away from Stevens as well, Exactly. Right? You know, so it helps with not being able to get caught to a point. So everyone in this hierarchy must strictly listen to Stevens' orders in, in order to maintain secrecy, but down the line, each center had their own cell of men that only knew their specific center. So it's not like everyone knows Steven. Right. It's whoever is the A or the center in the group is the one that's in charge of that group of people. And these cells were known as circles, 
They had one center, nine captains, 81 sergeants, and 729 privates. So it's like 820 people, I want to say, something like that. Yeah, and that's a big number. Yeah. Like, for people just starting their revolutionary process, that is quite a large number. Yeah, so if you're filling out these circles fully, that's mm-hmm. easy. it shows how fast this can grow. Because I mean, and I mean, you are delegating. It's not yeah. like you're doing it everything yourself. So it's a smart idea. Everyone in the organization began to refer to Stevens as the captain, knowing he was the one true leader in the group. And the IRB wasn't just recruiting laymen. They were infiltrating Irish military conscripts and the British regiments. And the movement was gaining ground with circles in the U.S. who had promised to aid when the rising occurred by sending men, money, and weapons. So it's not just in Ireland anymore. Right. Yeah, the United States loves to poke fun at the British in any way that we can. The British caught wind of these underground stirrings and began to arrest suspected collaborators. And when the press caught wind, they named this new group, the IRB, they nicknamed them the Fenians. I don't really know why. <laughs> I was about to say, in all the research, too, like the Fenians, that what does that even mean? I know, because when I looked up the Catalpa rescue at the beginning, they were like, ah, six Fenian prisoners. I'm like, what is a Fenian? Who is that? Right. And Google just says, like, it's just what they call them. <laughs> There's no backstory. Yeah, it's just this press making them a nickname. It's like nicknaming these serial killers, <laughs> except they nicknamed this revolutionary group. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, oh, I found it. So it's a offensive or derogatory term for Catholics okay. in Ireland. So Gotcha. So not a good name. No. But at the same time, pro-Irish sentiment was growing amongst the people, with over 200,000 people attending the funeral procession of an Irish patriot who had passed away recently, which led Stevens to jump on the opportunity not only by inciting his people to fight, but by publishing a newspaper called The Irish People to help raise money as well as spread word about the organization. More and more people joined on, such as the strong and handsome John Devoy, a former French military sign-on from Ireland, whose job was specifically to recruit other military men to like, pretty much infiltrate the British ranks. I mean, you have to have a spy network. When we covered spies in the revolutionary war that was such a key part of both of course like the huge empire the huge british empire has their spies but america outspied the british and that helps with when you're a smaller force when you're doing these guerrilla tactics you have to have the best information exactly and in this case i mean being able to infiltrate the british government in many different circles many different levels like that's absolutely huge so with John DeVoy, join multiple more military men, all Irish, but serving in their oppressors' ranks. And just about this time, the American Civil War ended, and the soldiers from America who were tied up in that fight can now turn their attention to fighting in their native Ireland. James Stevens at this time writes that he believes he has around 54,000 men, with more waiting in the wings should he need them for a total force of possibly around 80,000 people. John DeVoy estimates that of the 26,000 men serving in the British Army in Ireland, around 8,000 of them are devoted to the Fenian cause. That's like 30%. That's yeah. such a huge number. It is crazy. Yeah. So they've got a lo- a, supposedly a lot of people at right. this point. And I mean, that's a giant army, but you're also going up against the British. The biggest army yeah, so, and Navy. And, and- most funded yeah (laughs) and the biggest dicks (laughs) and the thing is one slip up pretty much throws a wrench in the entire works Mm -hmm. and that's exactly what happens because in another very hilarious turn of events one of the fenians was carrying sensitive documents and decided to hide them during his travel by pinning them to his underwear but when he crossed through a railway station, those documents fell out of his underwear, and they are found by a passerby who gives them to someone else, who eventually gives them to the police, and thus they go straight to the detective division at the Dublin Castle. That's, that's just the worst. He probably thought he had it made, that he was so smart, and then all of a sudden his underwear... Did he just feel something drop in I'm, his drawers? Yeah, I was going to say, how do you not feel something fall out of your underwear? Because it's got to go like out of your underwear and like down your leg. Literally. Yeah, that is so <laughs> like so obscure. But it also makes me think like there's a, I believe there's a classic story where well, like the Roman Empire, 
used to tattoo or like write messages on yeah. people's foreheads and like slap a toupee, if you will. Yeah. Or, or not toupee, their hair would just grow yeah, back. I was going to say they just laid it for the hair to grow back. Yeah. Right. But then like one got found out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then that's how they discovered like a huge message. Yeah, exactly. It's crazy how they used to do this stuff. Mm hmm. But even with the police now bearing down to find the men listed in that document that they found, specifically James Stevens, the Fenians have a man on the inside named John Kelly who is able to warn them before the raids are beginning to take place from the police. One recruit named James Keeley even confided in John Kelly, that police informant, that his father has a stash of pikes that they can use once the rising comes. And that's how it just shows how trusted. Kelly had become in their ranks. But guys, the pikes, <laughs> you got you <laughs> I, gotta adapt. <laughs> just get guns. Right. I'm picturing that conference that classic conference boardroom meeting <laughs> where it's just but it's just like a bunch of Irish You're like, all right, revolutionary weapons. What we got? What we got? And like the first three people say, like, pikes, sword, swords, pitchforks. And then the last guy says, What about guns? <laughs> and then he throw them out, out the window. <laughs> And that's verbal memes with the Gems of History <laughs> yeah. podcast. Imagine it. Yeah. <laughs> However, the net was slowly closing in around the IRB, and in September of 1865, the Dublin police broke down the door to the Irish People's Newspaper headquarters and not only arrested everyone inside, but also seized all the documents the organization was housing there. Which is a big deal, because mm -hmm. the, that headquarters is kind of their safe house they they kind of held a lot of sensitive information there so the fact that they got in there gave a lot of information away right i mean it was the printing press right exactly like, that's that's where you have to keep your information <laughs> essentially the bookkeeper escaped along with another man named pierce nagel and they go to warn james stevens at this point so he escapes dressed as a beggar and he begins to hide once again the so, master of disguise yeah he's just constantly on the run i think this is where he used the crutches and homeless disguise and then, <laughs> and they tucked in his shirt and it looked like he lost an arm swept his hair back <laughs> right the loyalists to the British cause begin to descend onto the Fenians in their ranks, arresting military and civilian traders alike, and in just two months, nearly 200 Fenians are arrested with hundreds more in the eye line of the police. Some Fenians begin to abscond to places like the United States or Australia, but James Stevens remains in Ireland and continues to evade the law enforcement, even after his description is put in every newspaper and wanted ad in the area. So he is really proving his mettle here, where he's saying, I will stay no matter what the case, and I'm going to support you guys if you continue to follow me. Right. For all the Master of Skies jokes that I will be making during this episode, like, <laughs> Am I turtly enough for the turtle club? Turtle, turtle. Like, that is so impressive. If your name is on, if your name and face is on every single, let's say, like, town square bulletin board type deal, that's so impressive. Well, and, and at this point, something I didn't mention because it wasn't a huge detail, but he's married now. Like, he's got a oh, wife. Yeah. So yeah. he's got to protect her, too. Right. So he's got a lot on the line now, not only his revolution, but also he's got a family starting. So this is a fascinating character. He is. He's very cool. Meanwhile, court marshals are being organized for the Fenians that were already arrested. And in the midst of all of this, Stevens realizes that he really cannot move as freely as before. So he appoints his most trusted men to be in charge of the leadership duties, a man named Thomas Kelly and the good old John DeVoy. DeVoy immediately moves to recruit a soldier that he's had his eye on for a while, whose name was John Boyle O'Reilly. These are very Irish names. <laughs> Oh, you might as well just say St. Patrick next. <laughs> yeah. The young man, John Boyle O'Reilly, was an Irish patriot to the core, and he immediately joined on with the Fenians and quickly recruited dozens more along with him. He even offered to be an informant for the people to get docs, mm -hmm. like sensitive information through the British military, but they already had a guy for that, so they said, nah, I'm good. Which is very impressive to say, actually, sir... We got someone. Yeah. But this would, guy, you, but, would you like to apply for one of our other positions? <laughs> but this guy's also like 22. <laughs> so yeah. These guys are really putting their lives on the line here. Things are falling into place for a rising to come. And the men have training along with a plan presented by this new recruit, O'Reilly. But what they don't have is weapons. So they must wait. And the hesitation that they show is going to be their vital flaw. And this is mostly on James Stevens' part. In the early days of November, a tip is brought to the police about a man who might be James Stevens. 
police moved quickly and they surrounded the residence that they were tipped off about. And when the doors opened, they see their man. Stevens slams the door and runs upstairs to get one last moment with his wife before he's arrested. So the police swarm inside, get their man, allowing Stevens to adorn himself with his nicest clothes before taking him and three other Fenians away to face their punishment. Do you think that he was like, no, I'm a nobleman. Pretty much. <laughs> dressed like up as like William Shakespeare. <laughs> he was like, give me one last moment of dignity. And he put on like this really nice suit and a silk scarf and stuff. Let me put on my nicest disguise. <laughs> yeah. And his wife is like, damn. Yeah. <laughs> See you in a decade. <laughs> Just six hours after his arrest, Stevens is taken before a committee where he boldly denounces his arrest, stating that he doesn't believe in British law in his native Ireland. Not a bad call. I mean, very much sticking to his guns. Yes. The committee sets his trial and he is now befo- brought before a court. And the first witness against him is no other than Pierce Nagel who is now realized as a traitor from the Irish People's Newspaper. Mm -hmm. Stevens continues to deny the existence of British law in Ireland and is set to appear before the same court as the other Fenians later that month. He's marched off to the most secure prison in Ireland, known as Richmond Bridewell, boasting 18-foot walls with guard towers every 25 yards and giant iron doors to keep everyone inside. Yeah, the British took security and where to put their prisoners very seriously for the time. Yeah, definitely. It's I, I just think it's hilarious that he's at because he served as his own lawyer. He pulled the Ted Bundy before Ted Bundy was around. <laughs> oh. <laughs> also for a better cause. <laughs> yes. <laughs> one was a psycho and one was a revolutionary. So you gotta kinda pick your Yeah. But he was just like, Yeah, British law doesn't exist. What are you guys gonna charge right. me with? And they're like, We're gonna put you in prison. It's like British law, like, sir, we are in Ireland. There are four leaf clovers everywhere. Look at this globe. Yeah. (laughs) After their leader is arrested, the rest of the free Fenians realize things are pretty dire at this point. Not only is Stevens in chains, but they have had a spy in their ranks, and they're not sure if there are more spies in their ranks. But first things first, they need James Stevens out of jail. So not even two weeks later, John DeVoy and Thomas Kelly are waiting outside of Richmond Bridewell Prison in the dead of night with a storm raging around them. Inside the prison, the hospital steward, a man named John Breslin, tiptoes his way through the corridors to the cell of James Stevens. He's not a Fenian, but he is an Irish patriot. And as Fitzsimmons wrote in his book, quote, Like a huge cat, Breslin pads along the long corridor with feline stealth. End quote. Okay. So, <laughs> That's... Once again, I'm imagining a guy with the cat ears. The cat ears, and yeah. He's just like, senpai. <laughs> <laughs> then he hears something, he's just like, wait. Yeah. <laughs> so he, he sees does... a bowl of milk and he's just thrown <laughs> right off. Can't stop this, man. Yeah. So he, he does this feline stealth until he arrives at Stephen's cell and uses duplicate keys made by another Fenian night watchman to open James Stephen's cell and get him out. The men quickly and quietly get to the yard where a ladder is waiting for them. However, the ladder that was promised to reach at the top of the walls was six feet too short. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> that is such a... One job. <laughs> Who? Yeah, the ladder guy. Like... He just, like, eyeballed it. He's, I think it'll fit. Like, you know what? Eh. <laughs> but no worries. John Breslin can handle it because he runs back inside, grabs the night watchman who made the keys, and they carry two tables out of the dining room into the yard to stack on top of one another. Then they put the ladder on top, and Stevens climbs over the first wall, which leads him into the walled garden. Then Stevens throws a handful of gravel over the outer wall, signaling his men that he's close. And upon realizing it, the Fenians give the signal to each other that it's time to throw the rope over the wall. And Evan, do you want to guess what that signal was? I want to say like an owl going like, who, who? You're close. It is a bird. Okay. But it's a duck. (laughs) Stop it right now. (laughs) And it's funny because in the book he says there was a false alarm because there was an actual duck in the area that made a noise and threw a false flag. The people outside were like, Damn, that's a good duck. <laughs> didn't Who's know, doing that? I didn't know that whole Jimmy boy could do that. <laughs> Fitzgerald, is that you? <laughs> yeah, he's freaking... <laughs> that's a goose, but you get it. So they do their quack quacks outside of the wall, and then they throw a rope over to James Stevens, who then grabs it and is pulled up to the top of the wall. 
But once sitting on top of the wall, he realized that he has no way to get off of the 18-foot wall. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's like, I got a rope to pull me over, but I don't have a rope to lower myself. Right. That has to be, you can literally see freedom, and it's 18-foot drop. <laughs> yeah. So the men just tell him, hey, put your back against the wall and just drop, and we'll catch you, which he does. And then he falls feet first onto the chest of one of the men, while the rest catch him and put him on the ground. God bless the Irish. <laughs> That's so, why does that just make sense? It is the best escape story. <laughs> like, First of all, the guys are just hauling tables out of the dining room. Right. Like, we can do this still. Don't worry. The guards there and that prison, you maybe the most yeah. silliest goose. I had to like, be like absolutely oblivious. <laughs> I mean, there was a storm going on, but still. There's guard towers every 25 meters. There's freaking <laughs> ducks going <laughs> off. There's gravel throwing. There's ropes everywhere. Yeah. Two of the tables are missing. Uh, it's it's so funny. But these men that catch him quickly move him to one of six designated houses. And the reason there's six is because Stephen said, I'm not gonna know I'm not gonna say which one I'm going to until the night of. So basically, there's no way to know where he's gonna be, even if you're with him. Mm-hmm. And thus, James Stevens is free. Now that's a prison break. That is so cool. And they organized it in like less than two weeks. That's so impressive. Insane. The prison is obviously frantic the next morning, and the man in the cell next to Stevens was supposed to alert the guards by banging a gong if he heard any noise from Stevens' cell. But when asked, he said he didn't because he knew that this he knew that the escapee was likely being helped by armed men and they could have shot him if they wanted to, which is a fair argument. (laughs) Very fair to be like, I don't want to die. Yeah. (laughs) The night watchman who aided in the escape was arrested, but John Breslin, the man who originally broke him out of his cell, isn't found out. So for the Fenians, this was a huge success. And with the hearings about to take place for those Fenians in custody, they ask their fugitive leader, is it time for the rising? Mm. And I mean, it makes sense. They have public support now. Everyone's kind of in a frenzy saying, oh, they did it. They they went against the British and they won. Mm-hmm. And the British are wheeling, like all the cops are walking through the streets dejected saying we failed. So it's a perfect time, you would think. Right, like now's the time to strike. But amidst the throng of support from the other Fenian captains, Stephen says it isn't the time yet. They still need more weapons and they need more money. And after the meeting, Stephen recruits one of his men to help smuggle him out of Ireland and go to the United States. Yeah, that's a tough thing for like those captains, right? We're still talking about 20 some year old men, right? Some of them are older, but yeah. Right, but like still like younger men. So very hot headed, very much like like you mentioned, very inspired right now. They want to go. But Stevens, I think he does a great job of keeping like I do agree with the move of like let's wait a second we still only have pikes and exactly seven dollars to actually spend money and i do agree with i agree with stevens to a point because he does this so many different times that i like he mentions in the book that john devoy kind of says i think he just got in over his head and wasn't ready for everything that came afterwards Mm -hmm. and i think that's pretty much what happens so it, it kind of falls apart on his end but By January of the next year, the other Fenians are planning to usurp Stephen's authority, with some deserting their military posts under pressure of being discovered, and John DeVoy brings in a former Confederate soldier to help them plan their guerrilla tactics. So the British really need some sort of win at this point, while the Fenians are seemingly more energized than ever. And things look good on the surface, but behind the scenes, one man is plotting his final move. This man spots a man he recognizes as a Fenian, follows him back to his hideout, and within hours, the police are there to arrest the revolutionaries. And within days, the Fenian ranks are being routed and arrested. John DeVoy, John Boyle O'Reilly, pretty much all of the big names are taken into police custody. And with one of the men being arrested with John DeVoy, a man named Patrick Foley, he's mysteriously released barely an hour after they're arrested. In the midst of the British revenge, James Stevens boards a ship from France to the United States, and he is gone. So amidst Mm. all the chaos, he's out of there. Which, I mean, it makes sense. He was just a fugitive from one of the heaviest, most heavily armed prisons in Ireland. Right, right. Yeah, he had to get out of there. But it's very interesting, all those dominoes fall, and then, hmm, one 
is let out in yeah. outward lane. <laughs> yeah. Like not to call, you know, a spade a spade, but, or I guess in this case, like a clover a clover. But <laughs> Yes. But it, I mean, it's such a drastic turn of events. Like they get their leader out of prison. They're mm-hmm. recruiting this, this civil war captain general pretty much to be like, hey, how did you fight against these larger armies than you and do well? Like you need to teach us these tactics. And right. then all of a sudden everything collapses. The British now focus on the men that they have in their grasp, instead of James Stevens. The arrested Fenians are hounded to turn on their friends and release information, but none of them turn on their comrades. During their trials, it is revealed that not only was Patrick Foley an inside man for the British, thus why he got out of prison so early, Mm -hmm. but so too was John Kelly, that inside man that they had in the police, who turned out to be an undercover detective. The Fenians are all promptly convicted and sentenced. Their convictions, quote, You have been found guilty of mutinous conduct in Cork in nor reporting an intended mutiny of Her Majesty's forces, and secondly, with having about the same time joined a treasonable and seditious conspiracy called the Fenian Brotherhood. You are to be executed in the presence of the troops of garrison. End quote. Very heavy charges to be read. (laughs) There was was no messing around this time. And the thing is, it's all political stuff. It's not even that they did anything. Right, yeah. They, I mean, they broke their leader out, but they don't know who specifically did that. They don't have any evidence. Right, at this point, they haven't, like, killed guards. They haven't done, like, any murder quite yet. Yeah, so. But planning, I guess, is quite enough when you're from the British uh, standpoint. Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty, heavy, pretty heavy loss for them. <laughs> yeah. With hundreds of troops at attention, the men are taken to the post and hung in front of a firing squad, but just before the moment of their execution, it is announced that due to their service and previous good character, their sentences are commuted to life in prison, and some sentences are even less, such as 20 years. It's a relief, but it only lasts for so long. In their confinement, the main military Fenians are taken into small rooms, strapped to a board, and without warning, branded on their chests with the letter D. And do you want to guess what the letter D stands for, Evan? Degenerate. Close. Deserters. Ah. (laughs) Because they were the ones that were in the British military that defected. Right. But one positive for those Fenians in Ireland is that the men who betrayed them are treated with distrust. Patrick Foley is immediately bullied and ostracized from his regiment, not only by Fenians, but by the British as well, who see that they can't trust him because he's a spy for one side, so why can't he turn on the other? He gets transferred, to Ire- or he gets transferred from Ireland to England eventually, but he's, his reputation precedes him. Mm-hmm. As for Pierce Nagel, who is the traitor from the newspaper, he's originally beaten and hospitalized, only to be found shortly after his hospitalization hanging from London Bridge with a knife in his heart. And on the handle of the knife was inscribed, Death to Traitors. Ooh, yeah, so they got their justice. Well, not justice, they got, um, I guess, I don't even know, let me do that again. Yeah, you- <laughs> Evan's advocating for street justice. I know. As soon as I said that, I'm like, great. But people would be like, I bet you're a big fan of Batman beating up the poor as well. <laughs> he got what he deserved. <laughs> it's like Batman saw a guy jaywalking. I'm going to break his legs. Uh, it's just how it goes. Oh, <laughs> <You know? my laughs> but anyway, yeah, these two gentlemen had certain circumstances happen to them outside of court. Yeah. But I mean, for Patrick Foley, it may may make sense. Yeah. Like, to be bullied by the Fenians in the military after you just sold out your brothers that you said you would serve with and you took an oath with. Yeah. yeah, It's it's kind of a big deal, so I guess it kind of deserves that. And I'm assuming there's some sort of oath process for the British government (laughs) as well, so (laughs) that's that's two oaths. It's true, true, true. For those counting at home. Back in the United States, James Stevens is attempting to rally the American Fenian arms. They need to support their native Irish, native Irish brothers, obviously. Similarly, John Breslin, the man who helped facilitate John Stevens' escape from prison, the uh, cat man, as it were, flees from Ireland to the United States under pressure of heavy questioning on his end. Stevens throws around the idea of having the Fenians organize once again, but this time in America, and plan a mass landing and assault in Ireland. 
But others insist that instead of this somewhat logical plan, they should invade Canada and then trade that part of Canada that they take over back to the British for Ireland's freedom. Oh, so there's a few different ideas spinning again in that boardroom. <laughs> a, couple, a couple ideas. Yeah. <laughs> The land invasion of Ireland would be something. See, that would be awesome. That would be... That's a good plan, though, because like you can organize freely in America, and then just right? once you have enough support, just buy a way to get there. Right. All you need is a few boats. <laughs> then someone's just like, let's invade Canada. Yeah, someone... <laughs> Come <yeah>. on, guys. <laughs> let's get those like maple syrup eating, like, oh, whoa, <laughs> sir, sir, like, calm down. But in the end, none of it matters. Because- <laughs> Canada's mine and it's like own dang business <laughs> exactly. at this time. Like, what did we do? We didn't do anything. <laughs> like, we're under the control of the French half the time. Right, so yeah. What do you guys want from us? <laughs> right. It's like they get to Canada and like, wait, why did that one say bonjour? <laughs> so they invade <laughs> the wrong part. an Irish thing. <laughs> yeah, they invade the wrong part of Canada. But none of it really matters because back in Ireland, Thomas Kelly is actively moving to oppose James Stevens' orders and plans for the Rising to take place in February of 1867. So that date originally came and went, delayed in a wait for more men, money, and munitions, and the new final date for the Rising was set to March 5th. But it looks like the luck of the Irish was not on their side because on that date, it seems God himself was against the Fenians. A large snowstorm rolled in, but alas, the plan moved forward. So groups of Fenians trudged through the snow, swarming police barracks, taking those inside as prisoners. But their main plan was to overtake a castle full of tens of thousands of firearms, and it was foiled because their plan was tipped off beforehand. It's always the information leaking. It is. The biggest problem for the Rising, however, was the lack of support from the locals, because with it being freezing and snowing, few wanted to aid the cold revolution. (laughs) Yeah, you can't do a revolution during bad weather. I think that's just... Doesn't work. That was the key. Like, 1776, best year of weather the United States has ever had, I assume. (laughs) Had to to have been. Had to have been. (laughs) As Fitzsimmons put it, quote... Everywhere that the rising rises, the British loyalists are able to muster enough force to see a falling, end quote. According to some, the only positive of this rising is that it failed so quickly that not many people got hurt. Some of the arrested Fenians are sentenced to 15 years, while one was sentenced to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. Oh my God. Which is aggressive. How and did who, they pick that one? Just like, eeny, meeny, miny? It was just <laughs> one random guy, too. Yeah. <laughs> and who is to blame? Well, John DeVoy says it's James Stevens because his inaction proved it provided fertile ground for this failed revolution to occur in the first place. Now that most of the major players in the Fenian Brotherhood were behind bars, they're shuttled from prison to prison in an attempt to confuse any possible prison breaks. And eventually, a move is made that foments the crux of our story. The quote unquote worst of the Fenians are sent to Fremantle an isolated settlement in Australia. So we're finally getting to Australia. Now we're to Australia, yeah. (laughs) Welcome. A a transport named the Hugomont is hailed as a transport for these prisoners, and the three-month journey begins for the mutineers against Her Majesty's glory. And as one of the prisoners wrote, quote, A three-month's voyage on board a bridge and convict ship to an Irish political prisoner is an indescribable horror. It is utterly monotonous and is only varied by occasionally hearing the cat, which is the cat of nine tails or a whip, Mm. on a convict's back, the funeral services now and again, followed with a splash and the fines of a shark or two daring after the prize, the constant rattling of chains on limbs and hands of unfortunate convicts, end quote. That's like three months. Yeah, because they're taking steamers. You're literally just hanging out. Or chaining out, if you will. <laughs> the, that's the thing. Like they had more freedom on the ship than they did in prison, though. So it's right. kind, of, kind of surprising. But the, it's still like you're stuck in these under under deck quarters. Yeah. So and even if they do like overthrow the ship, which one of them can drive the thing? <laughs> that is an issue that they they suggest briefly. Oh right, yeah. Among the prisoners was the young soldier John. O- John Boyle O'Reilly, who had attempted three prison escapes before he got transported to Australia. He's just stacking tables and tables and tables to get over the walls. It worked for one of us. Yeah. <laughs> he, he described life on a convict ship as a floating hell, so oh, <laughs> it's not good. 
The men were huddled into compartments separated by iron grates underneath the deck of the ship, but luckily the Fenians had a friend among them who gets them all into a compartment with one another so that they can at least reminisce and be in the same area together. And despite the hardships of the voyage, the Fenians were able to talk openly and even sing and dance together, along with being able to move freely on the deck and take in the open air, which was something they hadn't been able to do in prison. So not too bad. It's not the worst, but then the monotony sets in. Yeah. To quell the monotony, the men began to hold nightly concerts in their holdings to pass the time. This is when they also muse about possibly overtaking the ship, but only one of them knows anything about seafaring, really. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, ah, I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah, might, and, uh, we might still die. And also, we're just going to be hunted down endlessly by the British if we get any control of the ship. Right, right. But also, do you think any of them got booed during their concerts? <laughs> <laughs> that would be the worst. You're you already imagine. on a convict vessel. <laughs> like, right, and Mom's like, boo. Sit down. <laughs> Once the concerts lost their luster, the men convinced the captain of the ship to allow them to write a ship newspaper, which right. they called the Wild Goose. The only caveat was they can't write about anything political, which is, I guess, a fair, fair compromise. Well, what are they supposed to write about? They're all there for <laughs> mute, like political mutiny. Exactly. Well, it included well, yeah, yeah. it includes poems written by O'Reilly, satirical news stories, a Q&A section, and even one article about what Australia was supposed to be like, which claimed the name of the continent came from the fact that they ate so many oysters and drank so much ale. <laughs> And this is also when the first ever I Spy was done. <laughs> yeah, like, right. I Spy with my little eye. Something gray or silver, if you will, because of the steamer. <laughs> or, or blue, blue, as in the water. Yeah. But I just love that he's just like, ah, Australia. Oysters and ale. Oysteralia. Oysteralia. <laughs> it's got to be that. I'm not going to lie. I did not put that together. It's, I looked it up. That's not true. Oh. <laughs> O'Reilly, though, was the men's rallying point while on the ship, and he kept them positive throughout the long trip until, finally, on January 9th, 1868, the ship landed on the western coast of Australia. Once the men disembarked, they saw Fremantle, which was going to be their new home. It was a shoddy establishment full of broken-looking people, with one landmark standing out amongst the rest, the prison. As one writer described it, quote, the native beauty of the place is blighted by the sight and defiled by the touch of the great criminal establishment, end quote. Right. Like Australia, beautiful coastline, but there's just this honking prison that kind of just uh, makes things a little bit more bleak. They said it, if you looked at it from the outside, it looked like someone just picked it up and placed it there from somewhere else. I mean, pretty much, yeah. Like it started out as a genuine settlement with no intention of like the Swan River colony. Uh, which Fremantle was at, like it started out as a genuine settlement and they didn't want to have convicts there. They wanted to throw off that stigma, if you will. Like this is West Australia. It's not all convicts. You can come here. There's the whole desert in between West Australia and where the <laughs> There's bad nothing are. good around us, but come visit. <laughs> right, right. And then like to summarize briefly, like the colony's economy basically goes to hell. Uh, and everyone moves to go to East Australia, which leaves like 1,400 people in the area. And this area now is like, hey, we need laborers. Like, we need people. And then the British government is like, we got some people for you. Prisoners. And then they got, yeah, then they built the prison. <laughs> that is one interesting thing about doing the research for this episode is it really gave me a better idea of how Australia really is a prison colony right. of the British that forms into a country. Because it's yeah. literally built on the prisoners as we'll see they built this western side of australia pretty much mm -hmm. it's crazy when the i'm just i always think of when the british land on australia and they see like the coast like the coast is green like it's fine land it's a like, beautiful country there, yeah. right so they're probably thinking like this is the jackpot like remember <laughs> when we found india and how there's just a whole india like east india trading company we found australia this is the biggest piece of land we've ever seen it's so fruitile. And then they walk in, and there's just a kangaroo that punches them in the nuts. <laughs> and a snake that bites them. Yeah, in the right. And yeah. 
Don't give me Starbucks trying to cross a river. And I've at never least, heard of a crocodile. And at least India gives us good food. Like Australia's got nothing for right. us, really. Uh, Australia does not have anything. I, think, I just think it's <laughs> hilarious that Brit- the British have like such bland food, but then they have really good Indian food. It's like, how does that? It's just so funny how that works. Can you imagine the first British colonizer, for lack of a better word, to just have some spite, like traditional Indian food? <laughs> yeah. Like a guy in a oh, powdered oh. wig. Like, oh, good heavens. I don't know if you saw it, but I shared it on Facebook it so today. And it was, there was a meme. It's the meme of the, the Hulk, like, walking up to a kid outside of that. They sit on the yeah. bench, and the kid is labeled as, like, an Amish kid who's never had anything else but corn <laughs> in his life. And the Hulk is holding out, a, uh, uh, like, his hand, and it says, a Carolina Reaper, Reaper. pepper. <laughs> it's yeah. like, that's them. <laughs> but, I mean, that is so, like, going a little bit off track here. Like, British foods, like, fish and chips. They colonized like a majority of the world and they didn't adapt any of their food practices. <laughs> it's still like very bland and like unsalted, like boiled meat. <laughs> right. Like they didn't just look at India, like their fine cuisine, all the places in like Africa. Just like, like at Germany. Like they got Germany, such good, yeah. they got like bratwurst and mustards and like, right. It's so good. Yeah. They didn't adapt that. <laughs> the British Empire, they, insane times. So the men, after they landed, are marched to the prison, chained extensively to prevent any escapes. They are shuffled before the superintendent, who tells them, quote, No prisoner shall disobey the overseer or any other officer, or be guilty of swearing, or any indecent or immoral expression or conduct, or of any assault, quarrel, or abusive language, or smoking inside the cell, privy, cookhouse, washhouse, or workshops, and so on. End quote. I mean, end quote, and so on. Love that they threw the smoking in there. <laughs> it's pretty much just saying you can smoke in the yard, that's it. Yeah. He also tells them that there's two ways to escape the prison, by land or by sea. But he knows that even with this information, their chances of escape are barely above 0%. Because on the land, they'll face deserts, salt flats, bushlands, and the many insects and other creatures that are going to try and kill them. In the water, they would have to contend with the sharks in addition to trying to find a ship captain who will actually take them away. Right, like you can't swim anywhere, so it's not like an Alcatraz prison escape type thing. Yeah, you can't swim through the San Francisco Bay. No, and you also can't, like you mentioned, like all those you know dangerous animals that are looking for you. There's also people that live there that are very unfriendly to, uh, again, people, not them, like yeah. people invading their land. Exactly. And I mean, it's just, it's, what are you going to do, really? Because right. you're, you're literally surrounded by wilderness. So even if you try to attempt, they're just like, well, we well, got yeah, horses. You're on foot. You got barely any food the day before. Right. So yeah. It's, it's just impossible. After the speech, the men are signed in along with all the details of their lives. And then those lives are promptly taken away. The men are reduced to a number, and they're sent to go wash themselves. And then once they get back into the yard, they're given another speech by the Western Australian governor, and then sent to their 7 by 4 cell with a 9-foot ceiling. And thus begins their life as a number in Fremantle Prison. That's such little space. 7 by 4 You can, like, barely lay down. That's, like, barely bigger than a coffin. Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That is such little space. I mean, and they didn't have plumbing. No. So, like... Get a bucket, probably. Get a bucket, yeah. Yeah. Not good, not good times. <laughs> Bro, prison sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about prison reform, am I yeah, right? Prison reform, am I right, my dudes? <laughs> Some of these prisoners would be commanded to do laundry, paint, repair stuff, or do chimney sweeping, while others would be on the chain gangs, breaking stones, and then others would shovel them into place for a road. And this is how Australia got built, pretty much. They yeah. break rocks and build roads. Yeah, the infrastructure supplied by Fenians. Prisoners. Any insolence, a single tardiness, or a simple lack of respect for a superior sends you to solitary. But if you do well, you may be rewarded. In one instance, one of the Fenians, after good behavior and due to the fact that he was a Protestant instead of being a Catholic, was allowed to get off of the chain gangs and work in a church, and he even led some of the prayers occasionally. So, I mean, it's not all bad, I guess. Just have to be, not be a Catholic, wow. <laughs> I'm not a Catholic anymore. <laughs> right, yeah. Some are allowed to go into Fremantle itself, 
which was a small rough settlement of around, at this time, 3,500 people with a few small shops and a couple of churches. In long-term convicts, the Fenians note that they had a squint in their eyes because from the years of breaking limestone rocks, those men had suffered long-term eye irritation. Oh, yeah. Just the dust getting in their eyes constantly. Right. No, so, pr- no protective eyewear. OSHA. Needless to say, it was a hellish place. <laughs> yeah. And also, like, that climate is very warm. It's and hot. Yeah, it is harsh. Like, that's why so many people left, like, when they started, tried to start a colony. Again, beautiful land. Very, very warm. And granted, this isn't, it's not all prisoners that are living. Like, there's, yeah. there are the settlers that came, they're like, hey, I can find gold here or something. And the gold rush, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's not all prisoners, but a majority of it is built by prisoners. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, it's, and they arrive in January, which is the middle of Australian summer. Mm. So, it's hot, hot. And all the buildings are limestone. So, it's just all white and reflective. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. It's not foo, rough. Mm. Everyone had to be squinting. (laughs) Yeah. Needless to say, escape felt like a dream for all of the inmates at Fremantle. With previous attempts, seeing men dragged back to the prison after running through the rough terrain and then being whipped upon return, with some even facing harsher punishments and being hung for their dissension. After a while, routine just kind of set in for the Fenians, except for John O'Reilly. Little over a month after getting there, he was sent south to another establishment called Bunbury. He spent his days carving through the Australian bush to make way for roads, and he even had a cool story about saving a tree by convincing the governor's wife that it was too magnificent to cut, so he literally made them form the road around the tree <laughs> by pretty much writing a poem about it. What a stand. <laughs> He's yeah. like, I've never... I need to fight for something again. Well, it's funny because he learns to love poetry once he gets imprisoned. And then on the boat, like that's his saving grace pretty much as he writes a bunch of poems. He writes one about the flying Dutchman that he reads the men. And then he writes a poem to the governor saying, hey, this tree's really cool. We need to save it. And then Mm -hmm. he's like, ah, do we? (laughs) And his wife is pretty much standing by and she's like, let me go look at it. Yeah. Let me take another look. And then she sees it and says, let's build the road around it. <laughs> She's like, he's right. Dang good tree. <laughs> it was funny because in the book, they put a scorecard and it was like prisoners to Viceroy zero. <laughs> <laughs> good behavior allowed O'Reilly to make trips into town and eventually he even oversaw other convicts. This allowed him to meet some of the natives who taught O'Reilly some of their ways in tracking, but one misstep and his officer withheld his mail for six months. And when he finally got the letter that his officer had taunted in front of him, he found out that his mother had died. Oh, that's... It's like I knew that, but... (laughs) It's it's such a sad scenario because the letter had... Apparently, the the way they sent the mail, it had a marking on it. I I don't remember exactly what it was, but it had a marking noting that it was about a death. Oh. And so he saw the envelope, but his officer held it in his coat and said, you can't get this. You'll get it in six months. What a dick. So he had to spend that whole time waiting to see who am I going to open this and find out his died, and it was his mom. What a power power trip to have over another human. So when John O'Reilly finally got the letter, he found that his mother had died and attempted to take his own life, but he was found pretty quickly and saved. After this event, it was then that he decided he would escape or he would die trying. He befriended a man named Father Patrick McCabe, and he consorted with this preacher who helped him plan his getaway. O'Reilly was put in touch through McCabe with a local who aids in the plan by getting him horses and a boat to get away. And on February 18th, a little over a year after arriving, John Boyle O'Reilly flees Bunbury in the cover of night. He gets to the shoreline and waits there for a few days in anticipation of a whaling vessel that will take him to America. He makes multiple attempts to make it out to sea and signal to the whaler that would rescue him, but the ship doesn't see him and his aides, and then the ship leaves. Right. It's kind of hard to see. <laughs> like, you're miles away. And like, you're also in Australia. Like, there's no light, right? Like, if you're not in the village or, excuse me, like the colony, and you're just on the just on the coastline like you can't see anything. but even even during the day like you're yeah. searching for a sm- relatively small whaleboat in the middle of the ocean yeah so it's gonna be tough to find them right like whale boats I mean, 
how big are we talking? Like what twenty ish feet, something yeah, like that. If yeah. like if that, like yeah. that'd be a they usually hold bigger. ten people, so it's right. it's not huge. Yeah, and but yeah, then he has to go sit on the shore without fresh water and mm-hmm. wait while these people that he's with, like the locals, are trying to get him stuff to help him survive. Pretty much, mm-hmm. so it, it it's a rough. I think it's over a week that he's pretty much just like dying of thirst and hunger and stuff trying to get out of this place. He's looking at the koalas being like, come here. <laughs> <laughs> when he's also, am I going to get caught? Right. So like, the whole time he's got to stress about that. So needless to say, hope is hard to come by. <laughs> but in March, Father McCabe finds another ship passing through who offers to help O'Reilly. But this time... There's a catch, because another convict caught wind of the plan and said that he would alert the prison officials to where O'Reilly was if he wasn't allowed to escape as well. And this guy, like, mm. all accounts said that this guy was a terrible person. Like, Ooh. he was convicted on multiple assaults. He was just kind of bad out of hell, didn't respect anybody. Loose cannon, So yeah. everyone was, we don't want to take him, but what else, what other choice do we You're have? You're kind of out of luck there. Yeah, so... To, yeah. So the plan was set, and a few days later, O'Reilly and Martin Bowman, was the other convict's name, were on board the Gazelle on their way home to the United States. They had a few near misses with British officials along the way, and one of those near misses saw Martin Bowman get captured by the authorities when everyone pretty much sold him out and said, (laughs) ah, he's right there. (laughs) We just just got the one. (laughs) You can take him. And... The third mate of the gazelle pretty much helped O'Reilly hide and got him all the way to America safely, where he became a news reporter and eventual partial owner of a newspaper. Which, what a come up. Yeah. He worked for it, though. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. (laughs) But the story of how they hide him on the ship is amazing. They So after Bowman gets, they sent him off, they're Mm -hmm. like, he's going to tell that O'Reilly is here. So they luckily had the paperwork of a guy who had deserted. Mm-hmm. And so they said O'Reilly was that guy. And then during the night, the got third mate tells him, hey, take this giant weight and throw it in the water with your hat while no one's looking. And then after you do that, run down into the deck of the ship and I'll hide you in this pretty much like locker yeah. and I'll, I'll bolt you in there. And so he throws it over. All of the crew are like, what happened? And so they see his hat, yeah. and they say, oh, he just couldn't take it anymore, and he committed suicide. Oh. And then as the, the British come back after Bowman tips him off, mm-hmm. they ask where he is, and they're holding his hat. And they're all really sad, because they like John O'Reilly. Right, right. And no one knows that he's not actually dead except the third mate. The third mate. And so he's, they're all really upset, and the British are like, oh, he actually committed suicide. Yeah, like, oh, ooh, so they geez. leave, and then as like after a day out at sea, they unbolt him from the locker, and he comes up, and he goes and talks to the captain. The captain's like crying. <laughs> <laughs> John, <laughs> it is it is so crazy, man. But he, for like all the stories like that are in the book that we're not yeah. going to get to. So if you if you want to hear more of those, you really should read this book. The it's great. power of like a positive attitude, yeah. Like, Keep in mind, this is the same guy that was extremely positive on the boat on the way to Fremantle. He makes so many right? close friends escaping. It's yeah. insane. Yeah. Yeah. Like, just having an attitude can get you out of the tightest of spots. Yeah. Like, a good attitude. After O'Reilly's escape, Fenian sentiments began to grow again. Public outcry against the British treatment of the political prisoners forced the British to make the decision to grant pardons to nearly half of the political Fenians on Fremantle. But the military Fenians, who were the ones that were prior to their incarceration serving in the British military, saw no change in their situation. And eventually the pardons were extended. All of the Fenians, except for the military Fenians, were allowed pardons with the caveat that they were never allowed to set foot in Ireland or Britain again, or at least until their sentences were officially completed. Which is kind of a huge step, like getting a pardon for being a political like activist, yeah. or I guess revolutionary in this case. That does not happen. So like sentiment had to be strong. It's also funny that they're sending them to the US where there's right. all an active growing Fenian community. It's like so. almost as big of a pot like Irish population as Ireland yeah. is in the United <laughs> States at this time. And that same population was 
previously saying, hey, we should organize here and then go invade it. <laughs> yeah, the entire <laughs> population is like, screw the British. Yeah. But this meant that John DeVoy, who was one of the Brit- biggest names in the Fenian cause, was allowed a pardon, and he went to the United States. And when he got to the United States, he was received in New York by thousands and shortly after joined a new group of Irish revolutionaries named Clan Na Gael, which Gael is for Gaelic, which is the native tongue of the Irish people. And this was a so it was a social group on the surface, but they were very secretly a group with grand plans for Irish liberation, pretty much carrying on what the IRB had started. Gotta beware of the social groups. Yeah. <laughs> Shortly after joining this group, John DeVoy became one of the leading members and worked to unite the rest of the factions under one front. But it didn't take long for his focus to shift, because one of the, Fe- the seven Fenian soldiers still in prison at Fremantle penned a letter to New York stating, quote, I am one of that unfortunate band and am now under sentence of life penal servitude in one of the darkest corners of the earth. And as far as we can learn from any small news that chances to reach us, we appear to be forgotten, with no prospect before us but to be left in a hopeless slavery. End quote. Just imagine looking at your life and like thinking about your next five years, and like that's your outlook, right? Like yeah. the darkest corner of Earth. Like that's how he described his situation. It's tough, man. And just knowing that your enti- the entire rest of your life is going to be spent doing hard labor in this limestone building or out in a chain gang. You're lucky if you just say, like, actually, I'm Protestant, but like, that's also <laughs> yeah. against the Catholic, like, the Catholic faith. Like, that's worse than death in that case. But then from you're one of the guys that just got a free pardon. Right. And you're reading this letter. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's tough. And one of those guys, John DeVoy, once he read the letter, he knew that he had to do something. Mm-hmm. Because in his mind, most of those men were serving time because they were convicted due to meetings related to him. Right. So he felt a lot of guilt for these men being stuck there. Mm-hmm. So he talked to the two men who came to America who had once served in Fremantle, one of those being John O'Reilly, to get a lay of the grounds and then kind of come up with a plan to how to possibly get these guys out of there. How to break them out, yeah. In order to break these seven men out of Fremantle, they needed finesse, not force. And that's what one of the men who was there said. Do you think that there was also a second guy that was like, we could just take over the colony? We could just take Canada. We could (laughs) exchange it for the prison. (laughs) So first of all, they needed a ship. And they needed a ship that had a good reason to be in Australia. After that, they needed a way to sneak the prisoners out undetected and whisk them away to that ship. And then once they have them, a speedy getaway is essential. Mm -hmm. But that plan requires money and a ship and a crew. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) The key things in any naval voyage, A, a ship. (laughs) Important. (laughs) Someone who knows how to drive the ship. ship. (laughs) And a crew to man said ship. Yeah. So to do this, John DeVoy hold public meetings to plead for those who are to suppo- to plead to those who are supported to their cause to donate for the freedom of their brothers still in chains. He finished his speech by reading a second letter from another of the Fremantle prisoners, rousing the public to promise money to the cause. And time is of the essence because one of the prisoners left in Australia had succumbed to illness and passed away. Mm-hmm. So it's not long before these men break in one way or another. So this left eight Fenians total in Fremantle, but only six of them were still within the prison at Fremantle, with the other two living in the town on supervised leave. Eventually, more letters were sent from Fremantle to New York, propelling more and more people to aid in the endeavor in any way possible. So with these funds getting raised, they now needed a ship and a captain. Step one, Complete. Secure the funding. Check it off the list. Da-ding. John Boyle O'Reilly was necessary for this step of the process because he knew that the third mate from the Gazelle, whose name was Henry Hathaway, was now part of the police in New Bedford, Massachusetts, which was one of the whaling centers of America. Mm. O'Reilly sent John DeVoy with a letter of recommendation to meet with Hathaway, who offered immediate help once he realized that O'Reilly was involved. That Again. Shows- yeah. Again, having a positive attitude 
gets you so far. They were so he grew so close to O'Reilly over yeah. their voyage. It's insane how connected those two became because he he didn't hesitate at all. He's just, yes, uh-huh. right. Like oh, that's his John Hancock. Like good, absolutely. That's his John. <laughs> that's his John O'Reilly. <laughs> yes, good. good, good, good. Hathaway said that he knew the perfect man for the job, a local whaler named George S. Anthony. But the problem was that George S. Anthony just retired to be with his wife and newborn baby girl. Mm. Can't blame him for that. Yeah. The group met with Anthony's father-in-law, who convinced Anthony to meet with the men and discuss their plan. And this is a fun scene because they met with no lights, because then you can tell who is talking just in case Anthony t- turned on them. Right. Because then he can't implicate any one man, doesn't know who it was. Mm-hmm. Anthony listened, and after about a day of thinking about it, he did agree to help. The next order of business, then, they need a ship. They scoured harbors to find a suitable vessel, and finally they did find one. After one Fenian supporter mortgaged his home to raise money for the vessel, the Catulpa oh. was eventually purchased. The titular title of this episode. A titular title? <laughs> kind of crazy. Yeah, right. The titty title. Yeah. It's kind of crazy that, I know it's not crazy, but like mortgages existed mm-hmm. like in the seven or 18, like early 1800s. Yeah. He's just like, like I don't f- know why it's wild to me, but it is kind of wild. like, I need a lot of money so i'm gonna mortgage my home and he got four grand so he's just like i'll support the cause with this and i know like inflation la di da di da but four grand yeah like, what uh, can we can we get an inflation calculator on four grand now 1875 hundred and nine thousand dollars still 109 grand <laughs> that's a lot of money that is very funny and he's just like you can have it <laughs> What a! I mean, he was dedicated. That's dedicated. a flex. Like that's that's pretty impressive. But regardless, the Catulpa was purchased. They spent the next few weeks outfitting the ship, which was transferred from a whaling vessel to now a merchant vessel, and now back into a whaling vessel. Oh, <laughs> they they had to outfit the ship with three whaleboats, plenty of ropes, chains, and firewood. And Anthony worked tirelessly to get it ready. He procured sails, he purchased harpoons, and he outfitted the deck with a layer of copper because they have to have those big stoves on the top so you can't be burning the wood away. Moby, a copy of the Moby Dick was everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And then Captain Anthony pulled together a crew, 23 strong, made up of Malays, Kanakas, and African sailors, which are all pretty much Pacific Islander people. Mm-hmm. But what Anthony doesn't do is tell any of them the real purpose of the trip, only that they're going on an estimated 18-month whaling excursion, and by the end of April, all is set for the expedition to depart. To depart. John DeVoy relays the plan once more to Captain Anthony before he leaves, which was, sail for six months, stop in the Azores Islands, ship home any whale oil you have, and then sail to Australia. And on the 29th of April, the Catulpa set sail. DeVoy stayed behind, not wanting to rouse suspicion from the British if he disappeared for too long, so only a couple of the Fenians would be involved. John Breslin, the man who had broken Stevens out of prison nearly a decade before, and Thomas Desmond, the military commander of Clan Nagale in San Francisco. So these two would take a steamship to Australia from San Francisco and be the men on the ground who would find a way to break the prisoners out of Fremantle in person. On board the Catalpa was Dennis Dugan. And thus, the men, along with Captain Anthony, began their voyage, whaling as they went to try and recoup some of the funds for the voyage. And whaling is no easy venture. No, not (laughs) at all. As one contemporary put it, quote, You are compelled to breathe in the fetid smoke of the scrap fires until you feel as though filth had struck into your blood and suffused every vein in your body. From this smell and taste of blubber, raw, boiling, and burning, there is no relief or place of refuge. So, to put in today's terms for everyone listening, uh, it stank. (laughs) It was, yeah, a stinky business. Yeah. And the men would, like, they would have a pair of clothes that they would wear throughout the process, and they would throw them away because there's no saving them. there's no saving <laughs> i imagine there's no saving like whale blubber clothes no not at all 
Breslin took on the alias of Mr. Collins, a wealthy mining magnate who is looking to invest in local timber or perhaps recruit prison labor for his businesses, and Thomas Desmond would act as a carriage maker from Vermont. By mid-October, Captain Anthony had made it to the Azores Islands and sent 210 barrels of whale oil to be shipped home. However, a majority of his crew also left. Oh no. (laughs) Deserting after getting paid. I mean, I guess to them, they didn't really care if these people, you yeah, know, they were like, well, well, they didn't know the plan. That's right. They didn't know the plan, but it's like, well, cashed in. See ya. Luckily, in the Azores Islands, it's kind of a stopping point for shipping vessels and stuff like that. He was able to find a crew pretty easily and smuggled them on board because they didn't have passports, and they pretty much just kept on going (laughs) yeah just keep it rolling you know keep sailing but as they go the crew does quickly realize that they're moving on the wrong course oh no (laughs) because he tells them it's just a whaling expedition you know we're going to certain spots and then as they go they're like we're not at those certain spots captain just whaling with the boys don't don't question the captain yeah (laughs) so captain anthony blamed it on faulty navigational equipment but he He just is like hitting his (laughs) compass (laughs) it's like it's like, like nor it's showing north and south. Well, he had like a chronometer or whatever they're called that was like faulty and uh, it, was, it was giving him bad readings. So he was going to the wrong places. Oh, like yeah. <laughs> actually legitimately. But then after he fixed it, he's like, I gotta come up with an excuse. Uh oh. <laughs> and he quickly realized that he had to tell somebody the real reason for their journey. So he pulled the first mate aside into his quarters and relayed all of the information about the plan to get these convicts out of jail. And he Pretty much was betting on the hope that this guy wouldn't abandon him after he told him that he lied. <laughs> right. The ultimate, please be cool. Yeah. <laughs> no. I mean, you've been on the sea for six months already. Right. It's, you've caught some whales. You've seen some things. Like We shipped some blubber. Yeah. It's, uh, it's not been an easy trip. No. But luckily, the first mate understood and said that he will stay aboard for the mission no matter what happens. And he is essential for the plan to succeed going forward. Meanwhile, by mid-November, John Breslin and Thomas Desmond had landed in Fremantle, and their aliases had worked. Soon enough, Breslin, or rather Mr. Collins, was ingratiating himself as the friendly American who spoke to anyone regardless of their station in life. The friendly American, do you think that still applies to uh, today (laughs) when people, Ah. when Americans travel? (laughs) Depends where you're from. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, he pretty much just talked to the common folks. He talked to the higher ups in the government. Mm. He talked to them all the same. So everyone's like, he's a good guy. Yeah. Hey, straight shooter. He even met with the superintendent of Fremantle Prison, who offered him a tour of the establishment and answered any of the questions that the quote unquote curious American had. He was like, boss, hypothetically, <laughs> someone was supposed to break someone out of here. <laughs> It's like, ah, oh, you little racks, like... <laughs> well, it was funny because the superintendent prompted the conversation saying, oh, only one guy's ever escaped from here. Yeah, and you <laughs> want to know like, how he did it? He's like, really? <laughs> Tell me more. He probably had a really common name, like, I don't know, John. Oh, Riley, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> but while on the tour, Breslin even walked past the very men that he was there to help break out. But he acted as if they were despicable prisoners with no chance of escape. In short order, Breslin is able to sneak up to the Fenians that are in prison there for short meetings behind the stables to discuss the plans going forward. He pretty much tells them to stay on good behavior so that they can be ready at any time. But at the same time, there are stirrings back in England as well, with a warning going out about money being collected for a possible escape attempt. But, luckily for the Fenians, this warning is ignored. That's nice. Yeah. The British government was like, can't trust those Irish. They pretty much say, we're keeping a very close eye on these guys now that John O'Reilly escaped. So the plan continues on until the time is right for the men to escape. And Captain Anthony approaches Australia when he runs across another vessel. And wouldn't you know it, it's the Hugamont, the same ship that took the Fenians to Australia in the first place. That is, that's almost like... That, that only happens in the movies. Serendipity. Right? <laughs> right, right. But Captain Anthony decided, hey, I'm going to go meet the Hugamon captain. And he asked the captain, do you have any coastal charts of Western Australia that I can use? Hey, and he's like, hey, yeah, I got plenty of them. <laughs> so he gives him whatever he had. 
Hey, Bob, you got a map? <laughs> it, he, he literally said, yeah, we got so many. <laughs> so We are overflowing with charts. Here you go, buddy. Yeah. By mid-March, the crew was set on their way to the western coast of Australia after getting the new charts, and two weeks later, the Catalpa approached land and anchored off the coast of Bunbury, where they would abscond with the prisoners if the plan went well. Captain Anthony went into town to report their arrival to the customs there, and the next day, John Breslin saw the notice on the board that, to his great relief, the Catalpa had finally arrived in Australia. Right, he's just hanging out for quite some time. And he's running low on money to try and keep up this facade that he's Mm -hmm. a rich guy. (laughs) Right. Breslin then began to send telegraph messages to Bunbury from Fremantle, communicating with the whaleboat captain on when the plan will begin. And Breslin eventually met with Captain Anthony in person in Bunbury, and the two took a walk and discussed what the plan was going to be. The Catalpa will sit off the coast of a beach known as Rockingham. There's an island off of that beach that the ship can hide behind, while one of the whaleboats waits on the beach for Breslin and Desmond, along with their Fenian prisoners, to arrive. Then they would row back out to the Catalpa and make their quick escape. And that's so many moving parts. Like, that planning is very intricate. I'm I'm simplifying it a lot. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Captain Anthony then met another local steamboat captain who runs a ship that runs mail up and down the coastline, and he befriends that guy. The man, who is a native Irishman himself, then told Captain Anthony all he needed to know about approaching the coastline, including the tides, the reefs, and the landmarks that he needed to keep an eye out for. That's one of those coincidences like he, that man had to be irish right yeah right like well, there's I, no like there's no like other i would say like person pissed off at the british more than the irish at this point but the th- the thing is he's meeting with an american right right he doesn't even know this guy's ir- like yeah. fighting for the irish so it's just very funny how he serendipitously meets all of these people that are like here i'll give you all of this information about how to properly navigate on this coastline so you can make quick escapes <laughs> that's such a <laughs> he pulls up a file and says it literally just says quick escapes <laughs> yeah So after this, the plan is set for April 7th, but just when things were setting into place, a British gunboat pulled into the harbor at Fremantle. Like, what is the luck of that? (laughs) Literally. Like, we're just about to leave, but then a huge frigate comes in. It is funny because for this plan to work, they needed everything to work out correctly, and half of the things don't, but it still works. Luck of the Irish. Yeah. Yeah. So this gunboat would only be there about a week, maybe to 10 days, but that pushed off their escape even longer. Captain Anthony and Breslin took this time to mark the spot on the beach that they were planning to meet at and waited for the right time to put their plan into action. Breslin met with the prisoners that they were going to break out, saying that they must be ready and they can't take anything with them, just the clothes on their backs. Breslin and Desmond acquired horses and carriages, getting ready for the plan to be put into action. And Captain Anthony and Breslin even have dinner at the governor's place to maintain normal appearances. Right, yeah. It's very funny because Captain Anthony's like, I don't know what to do here. (laughs) I don't know which fork to use. It's way too fancy for me. Right, yeah. (laughs) I'm wearing my blubber clothes. (laughs) (laughs) But on April 11th, the British gunship left and the plan was put into motion once again. Breslin and Captain Anthony decided on a date the following Monday, April 17th. Because it's ironic, too, that they couldn't do it that week because it was Good Friday on that Friday, and then it was mm-hmm. Easter Sunday on that Sunday. So the people would be in their cells pretty much all day those days. So right. they couldn't do it that time, so they had to wait extra time to go for that Monday. And fortuitously, that Monday would see most of the highest police officials being occupied because they would be celebrating the rowing races between Firth, Perth and Fremantle to see which had faster rowers. Again, everything had to line up like a rowing race. That probably worked out that that gunship came into port as well, you know? Yeah, it was the perfect day for them to actually execute this plan. Right, but also shout out like any other sport to uh, take over popularity. (laughs) Like, let's watch these people row. (laughs) Sunday night, the day before the plan, the Catalpa moved into position and Captain Anthony went to shore in a whaleboat to wait for the men to come the next morning. 
At first light on Monday, two men sympathetic to the Fenians' cause climbed up telegraph poles and cut the wires, effectively shutting Fremantle off from the rest of the outside world. After the roll call in the prison, the six men escaping began to move. One of them claimed he needed two of the others to help him move furniture at the governor's house, while another said that he needed to get more kerosene and on his way grabbed the last two on his way out. And just like that, the six men are on their way to the rendezvous point. And using forged work documents to fool the police, the men met up with the two carriages, driven by John Bresland and Thomas Desmond, and escaped to the beach. But shortly after they escape, the police are alerted and give chase. Eventually, the escaped convicts and the two men helping them get to the beach. They hop in the whaleboat, which is now 16 full instead of the capacity of 10, Oy. and barely keeping above water, and they make their way out to the open ocean. They get out of range of their pursuers' rifles and attempt to flag down the Catalpa, but no luck. Doesn't see them. It'll have to wait. And then they see the mail steamboat that's approaching. And it's uh, they know that there's convicts on the loose. Yep. So all of the men lay flat in the whaleboat and try to appear as driftwood. And it works. That's <laughs> and they're 16 not noticed. men in a 10-man boat. And... How on earth does that work? It actually worked out in their favor that they had too many because the boat was sitting so low uh, yeah. that it happened to just look like a passive passing piece of wood. So it was hard to see them for the Catalpa. So for this guy, yeah. for them laying down, it was probably even harder. So the, way, uh, the steam mail boat just passes by. And that night, the people in the whale boat have to survive a pretty vicious storm. <laughs> Nothing's Again, going correct. A boat. <laughs> yeah, nothing's going right for them at this point. Yeah. But Captain Anthony in the boat keeps them steady, even though the mast breaks and keeps them going. And the whale boat begins to move towards the Catalpa once again. And finally, the Catalpa spots them and begins to head towards them. But at the same time, a police boat that left that night has arrived and is pushing at the same distance pretty much towards them and the whale boat. So the whale boat goes on the opposite side of the Catalpa to put the whale boat in the whaler between them and the prison boat, and all of the men climb aboard just in time before the prison boat gets there. Like timing is everything there. Like that is so that's like what I think we're talking probably like what 10, 15 minutes. Oh yeah. They would have even been, slimmer. They would have been caught in because it's one thing to get onto the American whaling vessel. Mm -hmm. If you catch them in the whale boat, that's you're it's cooked. Just, yeah, it's just no allegiance to any country there. Yeah. So yeah. hours later, the same mail steamer that had passed by them was now outfitted with the police and made an honorary HMS boat for the British military. <laughs> and they go out and shoot a warning shot across the bow of the Catalpa and demand that they give up the prisoners. Captain Anthony said he has no fugitives on board. <laughs> And since they're in international waters, the police can't do anything aggressive and risk starting a war, which is reinforced by Captain Anthony when he points at the hoisted American flag and tells them that if they start a war with him, they start a war with America. USA! <laughs> USA! These colors don't run! Because <laughs> they're in international waters. They're far enough off the coast. So That is kind of crazy. Like yeah. international waters, usually I, whenever I hear that, it's like a lawless land. Yeah. But in this case, the colors. I mean, they help out a ton. The British are too loyal to their own laws that they're like, ah, can't get them back, I guess. <laughs> right. And also, like, you know what? Americans can have them. <laughs> well, they're close enough, too, that they can see the prisoners' faces. They can see them. <laughs> <laughs> they're just wearing, I know they didn't wear, like, orange jumpsuits, like, today, but, like, they can't just see, like, clearly there's, like, a number on that yeah. one. Like, it's, like, 0732. Yeah. So, the steamer kept up with the Catalpa for a short while, but eventually it turned back and went back to Australia. So, the Catalpa, at this point, is home free. Those in Fremantle are delighted by the excitement. They're just happy that something has happened in their boring little settlement. But shortly after, those feelings turned to disgust, as the remaining Fenians who are on supervised leave in the town are aggressively taken to Fremantle and thrown in solitary confinement. Right, and it's two individuals, right? Yeah. Like, so that sucks. It's a very <laughs> aggressive response from the British, pretty much showing 
we're not going to tolerate this happening again. Right. But on, on the outside, they're saying, you guys can have them. We didn't want to pay to keep them here anyway. So it was getting too expensive. So they're throwing up two different narratives to depend on where you are. I think that's just very interesting. Like the two individuals that were in town, right? And the guy that was acting as an American, like he had to run into him at some point, right? Yeah. So like, were they just dicks? <laughs> and they just, like maybe they were like at that point, like just British sympathizers or something like no, that. No, they, like, they helped though. They, they helped the Miss Breslin when he was in town. He oh. communicated with, like one of them was just really sick. And oh, so he was I just see. like stationed in town and didn't do anything pretty much because he was really sick. And then eventually he got away too. So okay, so the research <laughs> that I did was like no, yeah, the, yeah, there was just like two left behind. Yeah, well, there, yeah, and there's other. I think there was other political uh, Fenian prisoners who yeah. just kind of decided to stay in Australia after they were given their pardons. So right. there's those guys are probably recaptured. Yeah, it, it's a rough scene. You. <laughs> The escaped Fenian prisoners are escorted all the way back to the United States, and when they get back, they are received as heroes. The Boston pilot reported, quote, The greeting they received will never be forgotten. It was plain how deep a chord their suffering and escape has struck in the Irish heart, end quote. But there is no bigger hero among them than that of Captain Anthony, who risked his life for six men he didn't even know. Even in Fremantle, the population began to sing a song, which went in part, quote, A noble whale ship and commander, called the Catulpa, they say, come out of Western Australia and took six poor Fenians away. End quote. The most beautiful part about anything Irish is that there's a song about yep, it. Yep, and then they had to ban that song in Fremantle. <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. That is super... God, what a story. Yeah, those guys got out of there. They were home free, and they established themselves in America, and yeah. Can you imagine the celebration? It's... I, the, like, the Irish do it big, so... It, well, it's funny, too, because there was different American factions of Irish, like, sympathizers. Like, mm -hmm. they had the Clan Clan Gael, and they had the remains of what the IRB was. They had another one that was... So that all of them meet them on the shores and yeah. say... We want you guys to come to our side. And so these guys just got back and pretty much say, we don't want anything to do with this. Like, we're good. Yeah. Can <laughs> you guys leave us alone? <laughs> yeah. We've had our time. Yeah. So, but it, it is crazy. It's such a circumstantial thing to work out in their favor. Yeah. Perfectly. But it, it's one of the biggest prison escapes in Australian history. Well, yeah, like when they're on the whaling boat and a storm comes, like if that wave, like if a wave is big enough to topple the thing over, like they're dead. They're done. You know, so yeah. like there's so many things that go right. Yeah. And even when they're on the Catulpa on the way there, they got caught in cross waves, which is basically mm. like two different systems are pushing waves into one another. And he, it was at the, in the middle of the night. So he, Captain Anthony couldn't even see what was going on. He's pretty much just hoping by hope <laughs> that they survive. And they did. And also, this man, he has no like real affiliation with these men no, either. He, He's just this like, is, sure. This was his first time ever captaining a ship. He was a first mate before this. He was <laughs> never a captain. That is so great. <laughs> it is insane. But yeah, he gets back, sees his wife and kid again, and everything's happy ever after. That is such a beautiful... We don't cover many like super positive stories, typically. This is very fun. I, it is, I love this. And it has a lot of very funny turns of events. <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> yeah, I love yeah. it. But that is awesome. That is the story of the rescue of the Catulpa. Yes. Or the Catulpa rescue, whatever you want to call it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the Irish story of Australia. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Two of the most distinct accents, English yeah. accents. Yep. But yeah, we hope that you guys enjoyed that story. If you want to continue the conversation with us, you can follow us first off on our Patreon. Yes. Launched this year. Uh, if you just go to patreon.com and type in Gems of History Podcast, you can find us on there. Uh, right now, we have one level of membership, sponsorship, patronage ship, if you will. Uh, it's just $5 a month. You get a sticker and access to a lot of other pieces of content. Uh, so appreciate any subscribers there. It's yeah, $5 a month, $60 a year. That's a nice bottle of whiskey. Yeah. I think it's worth it. <laughs> For the amount of content that we supply. 
probably <laughs> pretty big. Str- I always struggle to come up with like what's around sixty dollars that I could say here. Well, just the with the whole move in sixty dollars. That's a nice, you know. Well, not a nice, but it's an adequate like end table. Yeah. You know, it's a nice little... A really nice frame for a picture. You know what? It's a good cast iron. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you can also follow us or interact with us on Twitter at gems underscore history. You can find Jacob on Twitter at Jacob from Wisco and myself at Wodevskis. Neither of us paid for Twitter, so you can't hear yeah, us we with don't have the, check marks. <laughs> this, M, this MF the MF or play, paid for Twitter. You can also find us on Twitter, YouTube, and TikTok and Facebook at Gems of History Podcasts on Facebook in particular. That's our discussion group where you can interact with us in a very personal way uh, and just continue the conversation, I guess, in, with other listeners. But yeah, that's where you can find us. Yes, absolutely. Uh, next week, we got the, the listener topic, which we mentioned at the beginning of the episode. So yeah, we we got that coming up, which if you want to vote, once again, you can go join our Patreon and you can vote on the topics there every month. Uh, I think that's all we got. Yeah, that's all that you we got. got. We got we had quite an episode. You, this just, week. you just said that's all we got. We literally just gave a two hour, two hour episode. <laughs> that was quite the episode. Uh, but thank you guys all for listening. We really do appreciate all you guys. And thank you guys who have donated to our Patreon. We do this because you guys support us the way you do. So mm-hmm. thank you guys very much. We hope you guys all have a great week this week. We love you and stay polished.